Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the IDA screening series uh, conversation. We're about to get started here um, with All In, uh, the fight for democracy. We're really excited about this conversation. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a few housekeeping things. Um, I would like to start out um, this uh, conversation with a land acknowledgement as we do for all of our conversations. Um, I'm coming to you uh, from Los Angeles today, which is on the unceded land of the Tongva and Chumash people who have been stewards of this land for generations. Um, I would also like to thank our media sponsor, um, IndieWire, for helping to bring this series to all of you today. And we are also able to bring it to you with support from KCRW. So thank you both. And um, if you're interested in seeing uh, the rest of our lineup, it does run through the end of January. So we have so many more uh, great films and conversations coming to you. You can visit documentary.org slash screening series. And without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jarrett Hill, journalist and um, Vice President of the National Association for Black Journalists LA. Here we'll get you here, Jarrett. Here we go. Hi, Jarrett. Hey, how's it going? Good. Um, I have to say, I am very excited about this conversation. Um, I have been telling people on the phone and my DMs and Twitter and stuff like, have you seen All In? So why have, have you watched it yet? I don't know if you've seen All In yet. Have you seen All In yet? It's so good. You need to watch All In. Um, and so I'm just really, really honored to be able to be a part of this conversation today um, with two of the incredible filmmakers who, who made this possible. So. First up, um, I would like to introduce them to you. Uh, both our directors and producers on this film, uh, please welcome Lisa Cortez and Liz Garbus. Um, and we will get to have a really great conversation about um, this incredible piece of work that I think every person needs to see. Um, I think that everyone should be watching this film, should be discussing this film. Uh, and talking with their friends and family and their communities about it. So Liz and Lisa, uh, first things first, thank you so much for this piece of work that I think is, is crucial. Thank you so much for that. Um, I have been describing this film to folks as the 13th of democracy. Um, 13th was an incredible film that uh, uh, Ava DuVernay obviously did uh, talking about policing and the history of uh, mass incarceration in this country. How have how did you all first approach this? How did it begin for you? Where did this get started? And um, since we're on Zoom, I'll, I'll call for someone to start. Lisa, I'll let you go first. Um, how did how did this begin for you? Uh, well, Jared, thank you so much uh, for your your kind words and enthusiasm about our, our film. The film, the origin story, is two words. One fabulous person, Stacey Abrams. And um, Stacey Abrams uh, went looking for filmmakers who could unpack this history. Um, and uh, she saw that post her run in 2018 that there was a need to educate people about voter suppression, voting rights, and the long tail in, of American democracy where it has worked and not worked. Uh, she met with the team at Story Syndicate, my partner in crime was Garvis and her partner in crime, Dan Kogan. Mm -hmm. um, they came on the project and I was so lucky that uh, Liz called me and asked me to join her in making this. Liz, talk to me about the beginnings of this film for you and, and your team. Uh, well, yeah, Lisa had it right that it was, you know, Stacy's brainchild. Um, of course, so many of us have been thinking about voting, I mean, forever and also acutely since 2016. Um, and one of the things that um, I think in all the, the coverage around 2016, and even President Obama kind of reiterated this the other day in his speech in Philadelphia, I think two days ago, was like there was this sense that people didn't turn out. Well, people did not turn out in the numbers they turned out 
for um, President Obama's election. And you could say they were not as excited about the candidate and the, on the Democratic side. But um, it was also the conversation was all happening around like, why didn't people turn out without context, right? Without understanding what had happened to the Voting Rights Amendment, what had happened um, since 2013 and the Shelby versus Holder decision. And we can't look at our elections. We can't look at voter turnout without thinking about our history and how we got to now. Um, and so that was something that I had been thinking about and reading about. And I know Lisa has, we both have um, voting rights in our DNA in very different ways. You know, um, Lee, my father was a lawyer. Lisa's family has a history of activism through the church. And, um, and um, you know, with Stacy's own story came the incredible opportunity to shed light on this much larger history with a great personal story, you know, as its beating heart, um, which was Stacy's race for governor, and of course, even her own education um, and coming of age as a politician. Um, obviously, with Stacy being at the at the heart of this um, of this story, looking at her story of uh, the way that voter suppression looked in Georgia with Brian Kemp and how. I mean, honestly, outrageous that story is in the ways that Brian Kemp uh, was a secretary of state and, and you know, was presiding over his own election. Um, I think what was kind of mind blowing to me was how parallel it feels uh, in a lot of ways to where we are in 2020, looking at our own general election. Um, talk to me about how you came up with the way that you wanted to tell this story, because there are some ways that it feels ominous um, and then there's also some hope in there, right? There's there's some hopefulness to it as well that that shows like we've been through this before. I remember on uh, the day after the election, I called my best friend because I had to go do a television appearance, and I was saying to him like I don't even know what to say, uh, and he was like we've been through this before. He's like we haven't been through this before, but we have been through this before. Um, talk to me about how you wanted to tell that story that was both ominous and hopeful. You really tapped into something there, Jarrett, um, about our underlying thesis, which is how the past is, is prologue to this moment that we find ourselves in. And unfortunately, there is a repetitive nature of the push and pull when it comes to the franchise. You know, we've seen since the inception of this country, there's a very small group of white men holding on to power. And, and through time, progress is made, you know, with the 15th Amendment, the promise of reconstruction, the retrenchment afterwards, the violence, intimidation, rise of the Ku Klux Klan, you know, post reconstruction, um, poll taxes, literacy tests, we fast forward to the this bright moment of the Civil Rights Act of 1965, and then the crushing blow in 2013 with the Shelby County v. Holder decision that, that guts the preclearance and opens up a floodgate for all of these very strict voter ID laws and purges and this horrible aftermath. And so, you know, when you look at Stacy's story, um, to understand her story, one what was important for us in framing this film was to place it within the context of the bigger uh, trajectory and history that uh, we've experienced. And I'm sorry, Voting Rights Act. <laughs> um, that history that kind of weaves through the, the, the story of America, if you will, um, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Movement, all of these different things that have, have occurred. Um, I have to be honest, I consider myself a pretty politically aware and active person, but I'd never seen all of these things sewn together in this way that I thought was so uh, important and impactful. Uh, my, I, I'm, I'm always thinking about, you know, the, the little parts of things that we see happening, you know, each day or each month, or we see a different story from year to year, but to see it all coordinated together, um, I thought was just 
such a, a an important way to show this story that it's not oh this isn't just a one off that's happening because of what happened in the Supreme Court or oh this didn't just happen because of that like there's a there's a, a whole thing that's been going on for a long time to try to support press the vote. One of the things that I found interesting in this was that a lot of the vote suppression, voter suppression has always really focused on black people, right? Like there was a voter suppression for white for, for women that, you know, women weren't even allowed to vote for a long time. But it seems like one of the most consistent through lines throughout voter suppression's history in this country has been about black folks. I would love for you all to talk about like what were some of the surprising things that came up for you all? Because I, I, I didn't even realize how concentrated that was um, throughout history. And Liz, why don't we have you go? Oh, sure. I mean, I think, you know, it's funny because Lisa and I are asked this question about what is the one of the sort of surprising things. And I think, you know, the the answer is embedded in your question, which is the cyclical nature of this and the repetitive nature of these mm. laws. You know, like in 1890, it might be the Mississippi plan, but in Florida, it's, you know, uh, in, 19, in 2020, 2020, it's, um, you know, a poll tax on returning citizens. So it's like these, these laws, they change, they may look, you know, they may wear a different mask, it may not be the billy club, but now it's, you know, the poll tax on returning citizens. So in some ways, there's something totally unsurprising about the course of history, because mm -hmm. it is, like you said, the same thing over and over again, right? It's generally directed towards brown, black and brown communities, against young people, of course, poor people who have a harder time accessing the polls or getting the proper IDs, they cost money and time. Um, so in some ways, it's all, um, it's all going according to script. Like Lisa said, the past is prologue, we see it, we see these connections. And I also really appreciated something else in your question, which was, um, you know, you could tell the story, say, of Stacey's race, right? Like for governor. And it's an exciting, crazy story, right? Um, but you could write it off. You could say, oh, that's Georgia, or that's that guy, Brian Kemp, and that's messed up. And, you know, but when you put it in the context of history, its resonance is undeniable. And that's what Lisa and I wanted to do with this film. And like the 13th, also give it to you in a way that like young people can like totally access this history and see it and feel it. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, like a lot of the answer to your question was embedded in the question itself, which is that this history is repeating itself. And um, our jobs as filmmakers were to draw those connections between past and present. I think one of the things that was uh, most impactful to me as well was the Maceo Snipes story. I was not familiar with Maceo's story um, uh, about him being, about them uh, the, white folks in town telling black folks, if you go vote, we will kill you. And he was the only person in his county, I believe, or at least in his precinct, the only black person to vote. Um, and they came and murdered him uh, in his front yard. I recently saw a piece by Alex Wagner over on Showtime's The Circus, where they're talking with uh, white folks in different states about how they plan to respond to the election if, if Donald Trump should lose. Um, and it was interesting to me without being partisan, it was interesting to me because they were saying that they are arming themselves, they are, you know, preparing themselves for uh, an uprising, if you will. Um, and it, it kind of rang to me in the same way that the Maceo Snipes story did. I, I'm curious about how you all have seen parallels in the 2020 election. Um, from the stories that you all were just pulling to write this piece, to, to shoot it and edit it. Um, what are some of the things that were concerning to you as you saw them happening and then watching them happening in real time as well? Uh, Lisa, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from you. Jared, I think uh, one of the most concerning issues we wanted to, that we addressed is this whole myth of, of voter fraud, you know, and um, which does not exist. Um, but it's unfortunately getting fed to so many Americans, you know, with daily uh, tweet portions. Um, and I think overall, the disinformation that's out there. One of the things that, you know, Liz and I spent a lot of time on was, was fact checking um, and making certain that this history that we're talking about 
and the take and and our presentation of it is is based in verifiable information and it's not opinion based. Uh, Liz, did you? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that the like those resonances are really terrifying right now. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, right? Um, there is language of like military that's used in terms of this pole protection thing, like the army. Um, it does remind you of Jim Crow time, you know, type violence and intimidation tactics. Um, it's a lot. Um, I guess, um, yeah, like there's no way to really sugarcoat that. Like it's it's concerning some of the discourse around voting. And we've seen this already happening in the polls since they've opened in 2020 for early voting, that there are, you know, people shouting down voters and um, trying to intimidate them. So um, it's something we all need to be vigilant about. I think folks need to show up for one another. I think white allies have a big role to play here. And um, I think that, you know, we have to show up and, you know, try to bring you know, joy and positivity to the polls to counter um, what kind of, you know, the, the kind of voter intimidation um, that we seem to be uh, about to confront in, in larger numbers. I said that this uh, film felt both hopeful and ominous. Um, and we talked about some of the ominous. Uh, ominous. I wanted to talk about something that was hopeful for me. Um, I. Stacy's uh, grandmother's story was really interesting to me. Listening to her talk about uh, her grandmother and how she engaged voting was really um, beautiful to me. Talk to me about that story and what that, how that spoke to you all, uh, and and including it in the film. We were really lucky when we were making this film that um, Stacy shared with us galleys of a book that she was writing. And it allowed us to identify, um, you know, some of the special stories that are unique about Stacy and her personal history, and then, of course, intersect it with the broader history. Um, the grandmother's story is just so striking um, because this isn't a story from hundreds of years ago, um, and uh, this is something that I think dovetails to what you were saying before of there is a violence and an intimidation that has oftentimes accompanied the desire of black and brown folks to engage and um, kind of this residual fear that it can create and how it can make people not want to vote because of the concern for their, their lives and, and well-being. Um, just piggybacking off of that, um, but it is, it's, it's a story, it's a very intense story. And if those of you are tuning in, haven't actually watched, it's about Stacy's grandmother fear after the voting rights act, sense of fear and also shame after the voting rights act is passed, mm -hmm. um, that she was intimidated. She was still fearful of going to exercise that right. She didn't believe it was truly hers yet, you know, that, that she was so, um, had such strong memories of the billy clubs and dogs and all the intimidation tactics that have been used for decades to keep people from the polls. And I guess when um, when we look for hope, you know, the story of Stacy and her grandmother is one of hope, right? Because Stacy's grandmother, you know, as a as a as a grown woman, had this, you know, had this, you know, very founded fear of going to the polls. And you know, cut to 2018, her granddaughter is the first black woman on a major party ticket running for governor. Um, so, you know, we we find ourselves in a crisis, of course, but, you know, looking at that family and their history and the opportunity that Stacey was able to seize for herself, that, you know, that that's a measure of something, right? That, that in Georgia, um, Stacey Abrams won the Democratic Party ticket and basically, you know, got as many votes as her opponent. Um, so I think that when we look for hope, I see stories like that that give me hope. And of course, Stacey's, um, her continued work and her continued fight with Fair Fight. She didn't just go run for the Senate. She she wanted to work on the system that she saw as so broken. Um, <clears throat> kind of switching gears a little bit here. I was really uh, fascinated by your uses of animation. Um, there were some really cool animations in there that I thought did such a great job of 
depicting the stories that you were uh, that you were telling where there may not have been footage, right? Can you talk to me about the uses of animation and how you uh, approached that uh, for making this piece? Uh, we worked with this, uh, well, I think Liz and I were, were tasked with, um, in telling the story, ways to make it resemble good spinach. <laughs> And um, there were oftentimes, you know, s sections where we could have just had our, the wonderful people that we interviewed recounting the story. Um, but I think that something that you lose in that, in just pure telling, is you don't get to access the, the emotions so deeply in a way that animations allow you to. And to also to look at you know the interiority of of what's happening with the characters, and so we used animation very strategically as a a storytelling mode that to really enhance these um, sections where we were limited in archival. You know, with Maceo Snipes, for example, there's only one image of him. And uh, we wanted to honor his bravery and the uniqueness of that story. And so the animation allowed us to really give a voice. Uh, of course, uh, Professor Carol Anderson, you know, is such a fantastic historian and storyteller. And she really propelled, I think, the unveiling of that sequence. Um, but a lot of it also has to do with the illustrator, Diana Ejaita, um, who actually for all of the animations, hand drew um, each of the individual panels. Um, and uh, which was, you know, quite painstaking, but I think um, speaks to the uh, empathy that's elicited in the scenes and the, the texture and the warmth and depth of the, the storytelling. I, one of the other things that I'm always thinking about with pieces like this that kind of uh, hit me in my core for whatever reason, um, especially with the documentaries that I've done with here with IDA, um, is always the feedback that comes from it. Um, we've had many of these discussions with IDA with different kinds of documentaries and the feedback is always really interesting. I would love to know what the most gratifying feedback has been, but also what has been like the pushback in the feedback that you've gotten from this? Cause I imagine it would probably be partisan, um, but I, I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, well, there's, you know, so in terms of feedback on the, on the sort of positive side, I think one of the things that, um, I hold with me that was very gratifying with Lisa and I showed a fine cut or a rough cut early on to a class of students in the Bronx and high school students and um, it wasn't a finished film and we just wanted to make sure the information was getting through to you know that le like teenagers as well as grown-ups who might you know have already gone through a lot of this um, and um, one of the young women in in the class said you know, I'm just, she's like, is when that man said, you know, history, it's always a fight, you know, that that just hit her. And I think it was a way of engaging her with history as part of like a liberation movement. Um, of course, it has its successes and its failures, right? But it was really heartening for us to kind of hear this young woman respond that way. Um, so that, you know, that was an early bit of feedback that I know was really you know, important to me. Um, we've been attacked for sure. Um, a lot of sort of politicians in Georgia really love to attack Stacey Abrams. Um, some of the funnier tweets were like attacking her for making a pro-abortion film with us. Um, of course, we don't actually talk about- I was gonna say, I don't even think the word choice. abortion happens in this whole film. Like, yeah. what does that even mean? Right, so it's just like yeah, throwing the laundry list. Thing. Yeah. And it was that that was actually from an elected official. So, um, you know, so it's during the laundry laundry list of conservative grievances, you know, at us, um, which is which is fine. You know, nobody has challenged our facts, our underlining facts, and the strength of our argument. So um, we see that as a victory, 
Um, and, you know, we also have engaged and, I, and I'll turn it to Lisa for this, but in a, we have we have a, we have a very, very robust um, outreach campaign where we're bringing the films to film to church parking lots. And, um, you know, it's, it's just it's not it's showing um, not in New York and L.A. only. It's like it's you know, it's really gotten out there in a way that's very exciting. But I'll stop talking and let Lisa talk about that part. Uh, when we started the to. film, um, something that was really important for our team was that we would have a dynamic impact campaign. Uh, so we have a website, allinforvoting.com, with a broad range of resources, with everything from you know checking your registration, signing up to become a poll worker, but we also offer curriculums there for high school and college students. And um, in our partnership with Amazon, um, had these, as Liz mentioned, bus tours um, that went all over the country, not only holding pop-up screenings, uh, but registering people. It is, you know, I think as you've seen in the film and um, what's very important for us is that you have to meet people where they are. Um, and that this film is about igniting this civic engagement. Um, and in many communities, we've seen how the desire to engage has been beaten down, literally. And so uh, with the film, uh, but more importantly with our outreach, it is about continuing that momentum of engagement. Lisa, I'd, I'd like to hang there for a moment. Um, people have been in this election uniquely in the 2020 election have been really discouraged about voting in a lot of ways coming directly from the president of the United States and, and from other places. And it it is very clear to me or, you know, it seems to others, but would be clear to me that getting people discouraged about voting is a part of the process of voter suppression. Um, can you talk to me about the ways that you all found um, that that apathy was a way that we tried to get people um, to not vote in, in a voter suppressive kind of way? I totally agree with you, Jared, on, on that messaging that we're encountering all the time. But I would like to say, I think there, one of the big things we looked at, it, and Stacy talked to, when she first met with us, is this concept of people think it's just them, that they did something wrong. Um, it's so interesting what this, you know, it, you're, you get this postcard, you don't realize that you're supposed to, you know, it looks like a piece of junk mail. You don't realize that it's connected to confirming your registration. And then you go to vote and they're like, well, no, you've been purged and, you know, or you find out that location's closed and you've got to go back to work because you can't travel another, you know, an hour away from your home. Or you're in Texas and you're trying to find, you know, that one drop off mail ballot box. So, you know, the, what's happened is that it's been, the onus has been put on us and, and we're doing something wrong when actually it's this bigger system that is, is, is failing us. And it's so important for, to, to remove that shame, like with Stacy's grandmother, to remove this stigma that because we are, many people have been affected uh, by this suppression that it was on them. And so it is about what is curative in the process. Um, and I was also, in terms of the, the question about apathy, um, you know, and there, we have, a, we include a scene in the film, um, from Arizona with a with a uh, an activist or a volunteer who's going you know to Walmart parking lots to sign up voters and you know he encounters someone and he's just and this guy's like I'm not registered to vote I don't care politics doesn't it's like they're all the same they're all bad and um, and you know when you hear Stacy talk about that you know she's like 
yeah, I get it. You know, like they're, they're, the options have been really, really narrow. But, you know, we are here in a country where we have like 50% voter participation. Like what would happen if all of those folks who aren't voting, what would it, what would our country look like if you had 75% voter participation, right? Like if all those young people who are not voting, like the majority of young people aren't voting, um, what would our country look like? What kind of leaders would we be able to elect? So, um, you know, Stacey says, if your vote didn't matter, they wouldn't be working so hard to take it away from you. So I think one of the messages we want to instill in the film is like, this is yours, don't let them take it. And also imagine, like you look at the election of AOC and like, the, you know, nobody predicted her win. She was like 15 points down in her polls before her election, like a week before, but that's because they were talking to likely voters, right? But in fact, like all these young people turned out and all these unlikely voters turned out. And then you have someone like AOC in the district, which, and I'm not trying, you know, I'm just saying like change is possible when people really show up um, and um, it'll take a lot of people to make that kind of change, but we got to start somewhere, so. Absolutely. Um, I kind of speaking to the whole tone of, of apathy, I think we, I would imagine you as well um, have really been encouraged by the early numbers, uh, the early voting numbers that we've been seeing with people coming out in record numbers, you know, seeing uh, year over year, like four five, six, seven times what we've seen in past years nationally. And then uh, looking at the local state levels, I'm really curious for you all beyond the film getting seen and, you know, getting sold and people putting it on, put it on Amazon, all these different things. What are the measures of success for you all with this film? Um, and, and what you hope to accomplish. I'll let Liz go first. I've got a loud beep. I don't know if you guys can hear it happening outside. No. Oh, backing up truck. Um, what are the measures of success? I mean, you know, we don't, um, because we're with a streamer like Amazon, we don't actually get raw data about viewership, unfortunately. Um, we've despite trying a lot to get that information. <laughs> um, you know, we do know that the impressions, like not just the actual watching of the film of which we, we don't know the numbers, but the impressions on social media and the kind of engagement with our campaign has been really, really high. Um, the turnout in non-traditional markets for docs has been really great. You know, we had a planned theatrical. Obviously, we had to pivot on that slightly, but we don't have those numbers. So what we're really going off of is like sort of anecdotal um, evidence and social media responses. Um, so I feel like, um, you know, the fact that people are engaging, young people are watching this and talking, uh, talking about it. It's hard in COVID to have that same feeling that you have usually when you're out on the road with your film. Um, but I think both Lisa and I have felt really gratified about just our own anecdotal experience of people seeing it. And of course, reports from the road of field teams bringing it to people where they're at, as Lisa said. Lisa, what about for you? What are the measures of success for you with this film uh, outside of numbers and that kind of stuff? How, how do you measure whether or not this, this worked? Uh, well, I think in two things. Um, in, in my local neighborhood in, in Harlem, um, there's a weekly get out the vote session. Um, and I'm friends with the folks who do this and it's literally on the street. Um, and the other day they, folks pulled out a TV and started streaming the film because they loved it so much. And they were like, let's put the closed caption on and share it with the community. Um, I love that kind of creativity and excitement and engagement. Um, but also, you know, what we're seeing on our website is this tremendous uptake in people checking their registration, um, signing up to become a poll worker, um, and to really using the tools and resources to then take that next step. And the traffic um, that we've had has been really phenomenal on the site uh, that is illustrative, that people see the film, they listen to the call to action and then they circle back to see what else they can do. I, I would love for you all to talk a little bit more about the website because it's kind of like the, if the film is, you know, the, what we read in class, the website is probably the homework, right? So talk to me about the website and, and how you all wanted people to get engaged and what you've been doing there. 
Well, you know, the, so much of the credit goes to our incredible impact manager, Ben O'Keefe, and our team at the Raven Group, who spent a lot of time at the beginning of um, the campaign talking to prospective uh, partners. You know, we've partnered with folks from everyone from when we all vote to vote a Latino, uh, uh, black folks must vote, uh, must vote. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the probably, I don't know, at this point around 40 partners and we listened to them. Um, and it was important that we created a site that could be complementary to all of the other work that nonpartisan groups are doing. And uh, so that has a lot to do with the functionality and the resources offered on the site. Liz, did you want to? Okay. Um, the last thing I would love to ask is, you know, IDEA is an organization about documentaries and I, I increasingly look at all of this as some form of art um, in, in all of the different ways that we approach telling story. Um, for the people that will watch this film and be inspired to, you know, jump into storytelling in this way, what would you say to them to encourage them to use for using art in this kind of way to tell a story that will hopefully have an impact? Wait, okay. <laughs> um, I well, well, I mean, look, it's um, I think documentary is a really wonderful way to communicate with a tremendous amount of passion um, and clarity and detail, the stories of our time. And um, I think people really trust documentary. <laughs> um, I think in a world where people say, oh, this is fake news to kind of see topics covered in depth. And like you said, hopefully with artistry <laughs> um, is, is a wonderful way to kind of engage on subjects. Um, and in, in terms of people aspiring filmmakers, you know, it's so much easier than when Lisa and I, you know, started in this business. I mean, you really can, you know, create your own story for very little initial investment. Um, and I'd say do it, you know, and there's so many different platforms now. And it's a, it's a great time to be a documentary storyteller. So, um, you know, I certainly encourage people who have that thing in their heart to follow it. I think in these challenging times and there's a lot of darkness that, you know, documentary filmmakers continue to consistently provide and shed the most necessary probing light. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor and, and it's a responsibility that none of us take lightly, uh, but I'm so heartened by the reception that we've had um, which speaks to this desire that people don't want to just be fed a barrage of, of lies, uh, that they're looking for uh, well-researched, heartfelt stories. Uh, as I said, when, when we began this, I think this is one of the great documentaries of our time. I think it is one of the most mm -hmm. important documentaries of this moment. And I'm incredibly grateful to get to talk to both of you about making this film. And uh, for those of you that have not seen it, if, if you're watching this and you're thinking about watching the movie, I think you need to stop what you're doing, go watch this film, and then go tell your friends to watch this film because it is incredibly important and so well done. Uh, so my thanks to Lisa Cortez and Lisa, Liz Garbus for uh, being a part of this. Does that happen often? Liz, it does. Lisa, Liz. Don't worry. Yeah, you're 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 not alone. <laughs> I, um, I when I saw it, I was like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But uh, no, my sincere thank you. Uh, thanks for for this conversation and for this film and the work that you all do. Um, I, I appreciate uh, IDA asking me to be a part of this conversation. So uh, thank you to IDA and um, everyone. Have a great day uh, and go watch this movie. Probably watch it twice. <laughs> thank thank you. you, Jared. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely.